My name is Dale Johnson. I am a principal at Backstage Capital, which is a, a VC fund. But you know, today I want to talk about Maine, the ecosystem that you're building, and ways to make it a little bit more inclusive. Um, hopefully, uh, you'll allow me, at least in the beginning, to talk a little bit about myself because I am actually not from Maine. Um, that's right, I'm from the San Francisco Bay Area, or the Silicon Valley, if we're going to be exact. And it's always interesting, I live on the East Coast now, it's always interesting when I tell people that I'm from the Silicon Valley, um, because it evokes a lot of ideas in people's minds. So we're always seen as this sort of engine of innovation, a model for emulation for other ecosystems. But growing up there, I've always seen things a little bit of a, of a different way. You know, the, the truth is that the Silicon Valley is a very complex place. Yes, um, the Valley and the tech has been responsible for a tremendous amount of wealth and wealth building both in the California ecosystem, in the United States, and globally. Um, but the truth is that these gains have not been distributed amongst us equitably. And, and that's, that's especially the case when it comes to venture capital investing. And, and venture capital is the area where I sit and I have um, the most knowledge about. This here, these are two charts. Um, the one on uh, my right uh, is um, Google's uh, gender and ethnicity diversity stats. That's um, the entire company. It's even worse when you're talking about tech and software engineers. And then um, on the other side are 12 of the top uh, Silicon Valley tech companies, their diversity stats in, in terms of gender. So, you know, Silicon Valley, it's actually a really diverse place, a lot more um, diverse than Maine. Um, but, <laughs> you know, their record on diversity and inclusion, you know, it's, it's really been ab abysmal. And VCs like to hire and partner people that look like themselves. And the folks who become VCs are these folks. When a company goes public when it IPOs, when it's very successful, a venture-backed company like Google, um, a lot of their founding team members go on to be investors. If there's no diversity at that initial period of a startup building, say you're talking, hopefully you'd wanna see some diversity within the founding team, but if not that, well, at least some diversity within the C-suite, but if that's not there and that company goes public, now venture cap the venture capital industry doesn't change. So you see that actually going on today, right? Only 8% of VCs are women, 8%. 2% are Hispanic, and less than 1% of VCs are black. So it's probably just me standing right here. No, uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, I know a lot of uh, black investors doing a lot of good work, but you know uh, the point is that there's this uh, idea in the literature. It's called common identity bias, or uh, I don't I don't know how to pronounce it, uh, homophily, um, and it basically means that people uh, they not only hire people that look like them, but they tend to invest in people that look like them as well, right? So if the majority of VCs are men and the majority of VCs are white, then the majority of the founders that they invest in are going to be men and the majority of the founders that they're going to in invest in are going to be white and the, and the data bears this out. So when you look at, uh, for instance, um, uh, companies started by all women led team, 2% of venture capital funding goes to those teams. 2% of all venture capital money goes to companies started by women. And just for an example, 0.2% of venture capital funding goes to companies founded by black women. So, now, you know, some people don't see this as an issue. Um, they say Silicon Valley is a meritocracy. You hear that word thrown 
about um, very often, and this is just what you get when you hire the best people, but that thinking is not only erroneous to my lived experience, it's actually runs counter to the data, right? So data shows, and, and uh, this, is, this is a stat from Harvard Business School from a, a guy named Paul Gompers and his team, it shows that um, uh, um, both investment team diversity and company management team diversity in terms of ethnicity, gender, and school attendant improves investment returns and company revenue. Oh, just as an aside, this isn't even in this speech, but 40% um, uh, of all VCs uh, go to two, went to two schools. <laughs> Can you guess which ones? Harvard, Harvard and Stanford, yeah. Um, but this, this study that I read out of the graduate, uh, Stanford Graduate School of Business says that the more affinity there is between two VCs who co-invest in a new company, the less likely it is that the company will succeed. So what do you do in an industry that won't give you a seat at the table despite evidence that your participation would improve outcomes? You build your own table. So, that's where my fund, Backstage Capital, comes into play. So Backstage, it was started uh, by a non-networked, black, queer, southern woman named Arlen Hamilton who read all the data and saw this uh, tremendous potential um, for investment returns. So she uh, created the idea that she would um, have a venture capital fund that was verticalized along um, founder identity characteristics, so gender, race, sexual, and sexual orientation. Um, so she was from Texas. She had no connects in the Silicon Valley. Um, she went out there anyway and uh, slept on the floor of the San Francisco airport at night, and then the day she knocked on some powerful um, venture capitalist doors, right? And uh, by the time that she was finished, she had raised a $5 million initial fund um, to go to founders from underrepresented backgrounds. Um, when I heard about this story, I definitely felt a need and an urge to participate, so I reached out um, to Arlen via, via tweet, actually, um, and I started in 2017. So the fund was started in 2015. I came on in 20, 2017. By that time, we Arlen had allocated about half of the fund, uh, um, and, but I was there for the second half, and I saw us reach our goal of 100 startups started by um, underrepresenting, underrepresented founders. So we ended up with that $5 million providing seed capital to 100 um, companies. And this is, uh, this is the diversity of our portfolio against the diversity of most of uh, venture capital. You know, as you can see, it really sent a shock through the VC e ecosystem that this could be done because people had always said that uh, this was a pipeline issue, essentially, that there really weren't diverse founders there to be invested in. We weren't generating companies. We weren't building anything. So that's why they had to rely on their own networks and building. We completely um, tore that evidence uh, uh, apart. And, you know, this diversity is important, but we invested in uh, diverse diversity along, along many lines. First off, we invested in companies that were located all through the United States. Secondly, we invested in companies throughout all sorts of demographics. I, I was just talking um, about a company that just got funded. They just raised their round, led by Jay-Z's um, investment fund, Marcy Projects, it, uh, Mar Marcy uh, Ventures, and it is a cookie company. It's a cookie company that doesn't contain the top 10 allergens, it's gluten-free and it's vegan so that you can go and give it to anybody's kid and they'll be able to eat it safely, <laughs> right? So that's a CPG company, that's a vertical. We have a company, we have a drone that stops bullets. So we do deep tech. We do every vertical that we can because we don't just believe that diverse founders are situated to building companies that address their own markets, but that they have the knowledge and skills to be able to build companies that can address 
everyone. So, this is, this is us at South by Southwest. The people in the purple short, uh, shirt are um, backstage crew members, and the folks that are not are probably most likely the founders of the company, so just for a kind of uh, visual visualization. Okay, so once we invested in our first 100 companies, then the question became, you know, what, what do we do next, right? And, but the answer to us was very simple. See, because our portfolio companies came from all across the United States, we, were, we had to go and find them. So I spent a lot of time traveling, and Arlen spends way more, Arlen's the general partner, she spends way more time, on, she's that lady kind of in the middle in the purple shirt. Um, uh, you know, spent a lot of time traversing the United States, right, and looking at different ecosystems. And, and what we found was that the distribution, right, of diverse companies was different than uh, non-diverse companies, and that makes a lot of sense because a lot of times, you know, they didn't really have access to uh, Silicon Valley networks or uh, capital, right? So we... Uh, decided to launch Backstage Accelerator. And this program was a very localized program, and we picked cities that uh, had tremendous past and, and we thought could be models for reinventing themselves towards a, a more technological future. So we, we picked Philadelphia, um, Detroit, and London, and then we also put an accelerator in our headquarters in LA. And the reason we knew we could build a successful four city accelerator was because we laid the groundwork with our fund to be able to provide a support system for her, our cohorts. So every city team is run locally by people who understand their own ecosystems and understand how to connect companies to the resources in that ecosystem, right? We also ensured that there was a network of support in each city. So we were not going to build an accelerator in a city unless they had all of these pieces together, right? That's limited partners, right? People who could invest in, in, in funds, um, funds, VC funds themselves who could do follow-on funding for these companies, um, brands uh, who would support and become potential uh, partners and customers, um, media galvanized around the issue of diversity and inclusion, other community organization, and then friends and family to, to kind of help carry um, folks through. So these are some of our, our co-investors. You'll see some really big names there. You'll see uh, Y Combinator, Graycroft, Sequoia, um, so yeah, we have some Y Combinator cohort companies in, 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 our, in our portfolio. We have some Gray Caroft and Sequoia backed um, companies in, in our portfolio as, as well. And that's super important because you can provide as much capital as you want in the seed stage, but if no one is there in the later rounds to pick these companies up, then they're going to flounder, right? Um, so, so galvanization of a community is an essential ingredient in building an inclusive ecosystem, right? So throughout this whole talk, you know, hopefully I've pointed to a few things that, that could help Maine build an ecosystem, right? But I hope that the point that I got through, the main point that I got through, was that every ecosystem is different and, and is going to have its own particular right, um, um, lines of marginalization, its own cleavages, um, and you have to be able to find and navigate those things. So the first thing I would say is if you want to build an uh, inclusive e ecosystem, recognize the diversity that you already have. You can be like the Silicon Valley and say, well, uh, we don't really have people here that are, that are underrepresented, and so they're not going to build in, in, in anything, so we'll just invest in people like us. Don't, don't assume that, right? Make sure that that's actually the case because you might have thriving smaller ecosystems within um, your diverse populations. And there are diverse populations here, I've seen it, right? Understand your own particular divides as well. So sometimes areas of marginalization won't be, well, they'll always be by race and gender, but maybe it's not primary in a, in a, in a, uh, in, in a specific ecosystem, maybe your, um, your cleavage is, is through uh, um, uh, rural um, 
or it might be socioeconomic or, you know, but whatever it is, make sure that you find that and that you're not leaving those people out. Sometimes it's super hard. It's even harder to realize that you're leaving those people out than visible, right, minorities. So just run a check to make sure that you're doing that, right? And then third, just provide a network of support. Make sure that there are people there that, you know, once you have supported them, will be there to follow them on into um, their, their next rounds. Um, so finally, the, the last thing I want to say is a, a word on failure, you know. Um, pursuing a career in startups or tech, it involves an element of risk. And when we invest in early stage companies, we do so with the knowledge that most of them are going to fail, right? But we don't let that possibility, um, probably a probability, get in the way of building, right? We have to have an attitude, a mindset, right, that, 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 that sees uh, failure as not, not something that you seek out necessarily, but something that is celebrated when someone gives their all in the pursuit of something, right? And that will ensure that entrepreneurs are not discouraged from, one, building companies, or then, two, building second and third companies, because a lot of gains are there in, in, in the second and third company that someone um, Builds. So ensure um, that folks are uh, open to failure in the ecosystem and also that they have the skills and knowledge to be able to execute at the highest levels. And if you do that, I think you'll be well on your way to building an inclusive ecosystem. Thank you. Really, really interesting to hear about how you're thinking about things and approaching these markets. Um, as a start, I'm curious to hear about specific startup ecosystems that are inspiring to you right now, whether those are place-based or uh, groups, particular groups that are doing things really well. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because when we created the Accelerator, um, we had three cities in mind for it, and we actually left the fourth city up to a public vote, right? Okay. So we saw... Uh, these communities pop up and advocate for their ecosystems who would maybe not normally have a voice. Um, and it was very interesting. I mean, there are some that we expected. So Atlanta is um, one of these ecosystems that I would definitely be um, watching out for in the future. Um, there were some that we didn't uh, expect. Uh, the other Portland. Uh, <laughs> has a really strong um, network of incubators, accelerators, and um, uh, startups coming out of it. Um, Austin is also a really great ecosystem, but I don't think that's, that's, that's a secret um, anymore. Um, Tulsa, Oklahoma mm -hmm. is, is super interesting as well. Um, Minneapolis, I mean, ev everywhere you go, You'll, you'll see Pittsburgh, wh which I was in a couple of months ago. Um, that's very interesting. I think they need more investor support for their startups because they only have uh, two, uh, one state-run venture capital and one regular venture capital fund, so there's not enough to, to support there. But they're building, and they're really thinking about inclusivity in an important way. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll stop there, but hopefully that's a, that's a good starting list. That's great. That actually um, parlays nicely into a question that I had for you around um, location-based startups. So for example, there's a, a company in Pittsburgh uh, called Honeycomb Credit, and they do um, debt crowdsourced um, funding for small businesses based in Pittsburgh, and they just exp expanded into a couple cities uh, in Ohio. Um, and the idea really is sort of, you know, filling the gaps where kind of traditional businesses, service providers, lenders, investors um, are falling short with um, companies in kind of lesser known areas. Um, I'm curious if you have, you've seen sort of other examples of that um, in other places, kind of these place-based companies that are really helping to come in and support the ecosystem in a meaningful way. Uh, and if you have any suggestions around things that um, Portland could be thinking about doing in that regard. Yeah, um, for, for small businesses, um, it's, it's extremely difficult to build a, a business that invests in small businesses just because the return rate is so low, right? And an issue with these types of um, funding initiatives is that 
Pittsburgh is actually a really interesting city, and it's different because it's it's divided and, and segregated in a way where there actually is like a, a strong kind of angel network, and and they really care about Pittsburgh as a as an entity. So I could see it working there, and I can see it working in a lot of other places. But if you're talking about a really um, disadvantaged community, then it's hard to have the folks within that community lifting itself up through monetary means because. Um, they don't have any money, right? And they don't have a network of uh, accredited investors. So I think there, there's still <clears throat> a, a real opportunity for uh, local governments to um, step in and other philan philanthropic organizations, right? Uh, I have seen some things in the, in the United States that are interesting as far as like revenue-based financing models, which might end up, I mean, not killing VC, but, um, really, really hurting it, uh, which is, I think, is good um, because, you know, every time you give equity to a VC, uh, they own your company without doing any work. Um, <laughs> well, in a revenue-based finance model, it's like, uh, you ever see Shark Tank? I, I don't know if they took it from him or if this was an actual model, but Mr. Wonderful, where he's like, okay, I'll give you uh, this amount of money, and then you give me a piece of revenue off of every, every uh, individual item you sell up into a certain point, and then we're done. And if you can't do that, then you have to give me a piece of your company. So that's super, that, that's super interesting, and, and some of those models are like uh, ClearBank, and uh, NDVC, which is, a, which is a very interesting model as well. So there's a lot of things bubbling up, um, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they'll be, like those kind of companies will be able to handle the, the massive amount of startup initiation that's going on um, in, in, in small towns now. I think there's gonna have to be some element of government support for it. That's great, and I, I, most of you probably know this, but um, Main Venture Fund, uh, is you know a main supported fund, um, and so some of those pieces are. It's really really lovely to see that those pieces exist in Portland, and Maine Venture Fund has been a, um, you know, played a really critical role in in building the the ecosystem here. Um, what about rural innovation hubs? So for example, you know, Springfield, Vermont has. Um, 10 gig fiber connectivity, and they have this sort of philosophy of, you know, if they build it, others will come. Um, have you seen, do you think that that's sort of an effective way to, to build a rural hub? Um, have you seen other models that work? And in part, I ask that question because I think um, Portland has this very um, uh, fertile sort of entrepreneurial um, ground right now. Uh, and how might the rest of Maine kind of engage in some of that and be brought along in, in some of those initiatives? Yeah, now this is really, really interesting because, you know, people talk about rural connectivity. Um, I was talking to a gentleman just the other week named Clayton Banks of Silicon Harlem um, in, in New York City, and Within a city like New York, you have half of the, uh, a neighborhood where half of the households don't have access to stable internet, right? So it's not even really a divide between the urban and rural. It happens also within um, urban centers. And I think it's super important that we build up, you know, that initial um, base layer of support so that you can see, you can see the folks that will harness that and turn it into um, something in, in the future and, and build things with it, right? If they don't have access to the internet, then they're not gonna be able to become the next generation of, of programs. So these types of programs are super interesting. Um, once again, I think, uh, well, having internet is a necessity everywhere. So I do think that that's important, right? But it's also important to be able to tweak your funding models to support what your community actually needs, right? And so I, I saw that Boston was doing some uh, innovation grants around this issue. So basically letting um, different organizations, having a pool of money and then letting different organizations bid uh, and, and, and convince policymakers what the actual most important issues were, right? And that way you might see, hey, maybe this issue is not that much of an issue compared to this other issue, right? And then you're actually attacking um, the root problem problems. Uh, hopefully I answer that. But yeah, I mean, internet is, is important. It, it, it's, not the, it's not the only thing in these communities. Sure. 
That's great, thank you. Um, I'd love to dig in a little bit more on you and Backstage Capital a little bit. Um, I was curious when you were talking about, um, you know, like attracting like and all of that, who your limited partners are. So who's invested in Backstage Capital's VC fund? Um, so like most venture capital funds, we, uh, where if you're small, if you're like a micro fund, and a micro fund is honestly like under $100 million, the, num the scale of the numbers are mind-blowing. Mind um, but uh, it's usually high net worth individuals, right? So rich people. Arlen has been, our, our general partner, has been um, very conscious of making sure that we're getting money from the right people and that we're also getting money from a diverse array of people as well, right? But once again, you have this limiting factor of there not being um, many folks that are, that are, or as many folks as there could be um, that are angel investing in, in, in startups, right? Or becoming limited partners in funds. Right? So that's a limiting factor, but we've still done a very good job in making sure that our personal um, uh, cap, cap table, if you want to say, is, is diverse. Um, so we have folks like, uh, I mean, this is not a diverse guy, but it's interesting. We have folks like uh, Mark Andreessen, who is a, who is a uh, limited partner. We have um, Ellen Powell, the, the, the former CEO of, of Slack. Um, we have Stuart Butterfield, who's an, uh, oh, yeah, Ellen Powell, CEO of Reddit. Stuart Butterfield, CEO of Slack. We have uh, the head of design at Lyft, who's a black woman, and lots of uh, black investors in this as well. It really is kind of like a, a whole community thing. That's great. It's nice to hear. That's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your co-investors then. Um, so one of the things that, you know, this sort of notion out there that, you know, once you get VC money uh, at a particular stage, often the VCs immediately ask for a new CEO to come in. Right, and so if you're the next round out from from you know having capital from backstage, uh, and you have co-investors um, that may have a more traditional point of view on um, removing a CEO or replacing people in management, is there? Do you have some thoughts on kind of how you guys control for that, or how you pick co-investors that might be willing to continue to support the diversity and inclusion as the company grows? So we can set up a founder with with. Uh, with contacts for co-investment, but ultimately it's the VCs that, that, that choose or the founder, right? There has to be a match there. Um, so I think it's super important, and, and founders have different ideas about this. So it's super important to not get in the founder's way about like how they want to set up their cap table. But I will say, you know, if I'm looking at a founder who's black or, or who's a, a, a woman, gen I, not individually because everyone sees it and conceptualizes this a different way, but I want the general idea out there that if uh, you're black and your cap table's all white, they might more easily take take you away from your company than if it was diverse. It's a possibility, it's a possibility. You cannot get into the minds of other, um, of, of other people and they have proven that they are biased at least in some other ways. Um, I don't wanna accuse anyone directly of doing that but it's definitely a, a real risk and a possibility. Some founders do not care um, some underrepresented founders do not care. They're like, hey, you know what? If I can get uh, um, the best uh, VC on my cap table as possible, I don't care what color they are. I want the most money possible for the least amount of equity, and I want the most help possible, and I think these guys will give me the most help. So it's a, it's a, it's a risk, but it's, it's very complicated. I stand on the side of, like, you should diversify your cap table if you're a diverse person because these uh, diverse investors are going to be more likely to understand the cultural context that you come from, some of the decisions that, that you make, they'll be able to contextualize. Um, it's up to the founder to take that advice or not. It's great. Um, what sort of challenges have you experienced either personally or as you know, backstage capital, um, kind of taking this view and, and sort of bucking a trend? Yeah, you know, VC um, likes to talk a lot about uh, contrarian thinking, mm -hmm. right? But when someone comes with a real differentiated strategy as far as investment goes, uh, they, they universally pan it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it doesn't really matter what it is. I don't think, you know, I, I think this being about diversity kind of plays a role because there are ideas about diversity that say, 
um, this is a charity, this is something that you're doing to, to, to look good, this is actually going to, someone said this yesterday, I had a meeting with an investor yesterday, he's like, it's going to hurt returns, you know that, right? Uh, and I just didn't even really say anything to the guy, because I'm not here to, uh, I want him to think that, because then I have an advantage. If everyone believed that uh, um, investing in diverse founders um, was advantageous to them, then I would have no um, differentiation, and then there would be less of an avenue for returns. So, um, <laughs> I mean, continue thinking that, and as long as we have other VCs that get it and understand, and we have that network of support for founders, um, then they can go and, uh, and die like their businesses can just die and, cr and cr <laughs> But you're absolutely right, right? There's a ton of um, academic research out there that shows that more diverse teams are more successful, right? They learn to dissent better, they bring better, fresher, newer, different ideas to the table in a more meaningful way um, that can spur innovation, et cetera. Um, so I think you're onto something with your competitive advantage here. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot going on, right? And it's not just through um, by race and gender. It's also school attendance, socioeconomic, et cetera, et cetera. It's super, super complex. But I will say this, and I say this in an article that I'm writing, uh, you know, VCs just don't get it. It's like 40% of y'all went to Stanford and Harvard, <laughs> and you want to tell me that your network is differentiated? How? It's not. <laughs> and the number of VCs, especially micro VCs, are growing. So now you have this other guy who went to Stanford versus you who went to Stanford with a fund that has no real differentiation. Um, and, and so there's just more competition for a limited pool of, uh, in a limited network. And so it just makes sense to me that you'd want to expand your network and you can do it in a lot of ways. You can do it regionally. I mean, you know, invest in some startups here and in, in, in the, in the Northeast, create, you know, create a, a new hub. You can, you can do it, um, by country, right? You can go and invest in China or in South America or, uh, you know, and, or you can, uh, you can do it by socioeconomics. You can do it so many different ways, um, and yet VCs don't. Um, and it's super interesting to me, but it's great because I have so many fund theses. So when I'm ready to raise a fund, you know, I have a, a lot of ideas about about ways that you can um, gain an advantage over over VCs. It's great. Um, so one of the things I think is so interesting about your background is, um, you know, you're obviously on the investing side now, but you have a lot of operating experience, um, including at Google, which uh, was once a startup. Um, curious what sort of advice you would give to people in the room that are interested in either founding or joining um, an early stage venture, um, maybe around building diverse teams or how you pick a team, um, but just more generally, given all of the kind of breadth of experience that you've had. How to choose, right? This is, this is, this is my, this is what I do, and I'm not sure I know how to do it, and I don't know if other VCs uh, know how to do it either. I think um, you, well, I'll tell you what I do when I'm choosing a company, right? Because I like to be a, what you call industry agnostic investor, so I don't verticalize. Um, I want the founder to sit in front of me and tell me their vision of the future, and then I want to believe it, right? And so if you're thinking of, of starting, of joining a startup, then that's what you should do, right? You should sit in front of the founder, or at least, you know, if the company's too big, go and read the materials, talk to folks within the organization. You say, what is this? What is, what will this be? Because a lot of times, early stage companies don't look like what they'll look like, you know, when they're about to IPO, right? But there might be a roadmap towards that. And you want to make sure that everybody in, within the organization, at least from um, a, a high level perspective is on the same page about the direction of the company. Um, and if you believe in it, if you're mission oriented, right, and if everybody's on the same page, right, and, and they have the funds to support you, which is also super important, don't just join a startup to join a startup, make sure that the people operationally are effective. Um, uh, if that's the case, then join. Lovely, thank you. <laughs>